Awesome. All right. Hopefully you guys can see me. But um, hello again, everyone. My name is TJ, and this is my beautiful wife, Leela. And uh, thanks again for joining our midweek class titled, Who Do You Think You Are? And um, which is a class about us understanding our true identity in Christ. And so this, this again is a study of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, in which the Apostle Paul explains who we are in Christ. According to Paul, it's absolutely amazing as far as what it means to be in Christ, the way he explains it and breaks it down from a spiritual standpoint. You know, he makes it clear that being in Christ is the most awesome of realities. And over the course of these midweek classes, we were breaking down at least four realities of being in Christ. And so according to the Apostle Paul, four realities of being in Christ are in Christ we are holy and blameless, in Christ we are adopted, in Christ we are redeemed, and in Christ we are marked. And so during the last three midweek classes, we talked about how in Christ we are holy and blameless. Um, we talked about how we are adopted and also how we are redeemed. And so furthermore, during this last midweek class, and I'm sad that it's our last class, but we'll be talking about how in Christ we are marked. Okay, so in Christ we are marked. But before I um, go on, I got to have somebody open us up in prayer. And so, um, man, who do I want us? Who do I want to have us open us up in prayer? Can I have Ray? Ray, can you open us up in prayer, please? Unmute. Dear Father God, we come before you this evening, Father. We're so thankful, Father, for um, your teaching, Father, for um, just the leadership in the church, God, and how they pour their hearts into these lessons to um, bring to us, God. We pray that um, this being our last lesson, God, that um, we hit it out of the park. <laughs> God, we pray that we can glean uh, from this for a, a, a time to come, God, and just apply what we've been learning, God, and just uh, to go out and to encourage others with what we've learned, God. And I pray, God, that uh, you speak through TJ and Leela very powerfully, God, and that we um, we hear your word, we get what you're trying to relay to us, God. And uh, we ask that you, you be with us all here, that we open our hearts and our minds, God, and that we're able to receive your word. Father, we love you, and we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 No pressure, Ray, but you just pray. <laughs> yeah, hit it out of the park. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Bring you. it on home. <laughs> on. All right. Well, good stuff. Well, um, writing to Christians in Ephesus, you know, Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, as we're um, finishing up this uh, eulogy, as I explained in our first class about God. But he says in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And so I kind of want to open it up with this, uh, this intro firstly. And so as you can see on your screen, here on the screen is a picture of what is called the seal of King Hezekiah, the seal of King Hezekiah. And so this seal depicts a two-winged uh, sun disc uh, with an Egyptian ankh symbol on it on the side. You can see the Egyptian ankh there. And uh, engraved on this seal in ancient Hebrew letters is the inscription which reads, belonging to Hezekiah on the top and the son of Ahaz, king of the Jews on the bottom. And so, so who is King Hezekiah? And so King Hezekiah was one of the early kings who reigned over the southern kingdom of Judah for 29 years. You know, he reigned from 726 to 697 BC. He began his reign at the age of 25. Um, and you can actually read about King Hezekiah according to the book of Kings from the Bible. You know, uh, according to the book of Kings, which in the Bible is broken up into two separate books, you can find this historical uh, account of King Hezekiah's reign. And so just to read real quick, just five verses from um, the second book of Kings, chapter 18, verse one through five, it tells us in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 
29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, uh, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made up, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. And so this particular passage of scripture speaks of King Hezekiah in the context of ancient biblical history. You know, this is us reading about him from the Bible. Whereas this seal that I showed you guys speaks of King Hezekiah in the context of ancient world history. You know, this, this seal called the seal of King Hezekiah was found in one of the ancient royal buildings in Jerusalem. And if this seal had in fact belonged to King Hezekiah, that would make the seal over 2,700 years old. That's how old this seal is. And so as you can imagine, this seal of King Hezekiah is a great discovery as far as proving the reliability of the Bible. Like these aren't just people, these are just stories about people that were made up. Like these are actual people in ancient world history. Um, this, this here corresponds with world history. So why, am I, why have I spent so much time talking about the seal of King Hezekiah? What I really want to highlight is what King Hezekiah did with this seal. You know, when it came to the seal, King Hezekiah put this seal to use daily. You know, seals like the seal of King Hezekiah were used often in the ancient world. When pressed on wet clay or hot wax that had been poured on an object like a possession or a document even, this seal marked King Hezekiah's ownership of and authority over that thing or even over someone. You know, so simply put, in, in the ancient world, the mark of a seal like the seal of King Hezekiah served as a person's legal signature, okay? It served as a person's legal signature. Now, we don't mark things with seals so much today. Some people have like a stamp or something maybe with their signature, but for the most part, handwritten signatures are what we use today to mark our ownership of or authority over something or someone like our children, for instance. You know, we have to sign papers as it relates to our children, you know, who, you know, those who are 18 and under. But, but marking things or even marking people with seals were common throughout the ancient world. With all that being said, speaking to Christians in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul explains that God's Holy Spirit is essentially God's seal that he uses to mark those who've become Christians. And so again, with that, with that background in mind, you know, again, reading, uh, read, writing to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul wrote saying, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Another English translation of that same passage reads like this. It says, you also became believers in Christ. So we're saying you became Christians. That happened when you heard the message of truth. It was the good news about how you could be saved. When you believed, he, that being God, stamped you with his official, with an official mark. That official mark is the Holy Spirit that he promised. The Spirit marks us as God's own. Now, um, we can now be sure that someday we will receive all that God has promised, which is so cool. And so, so God's seal is not like the United States seal, which is simply an emblem, you know, that's, that signifies power and authority. You know, this seal is our seal for the, the U.S. But when you really think about this seal, this seal is only found on paper or on places like the side of a building, right? But God's seal is the Holy Spirit who is God himself right? Mm -hmm. Which can be found present in those who have put their faith in the Son of God, who is Christ Jesus. And, and any person who chooses to put their faith in the Son of God, who is Christ Jesus, will be marked by God with his seal, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so that's so cool. Now, now when it comes to people who are marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, people are promised two important things. In other words, it means two things. And, and, and really, it means a lot of different things, but today I'm just only going to talk about two important things. And so, so what does it mean? One thing, firstly, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit means that you are 
a possession of God's now. You're a possession of God's now. You know, when a person is marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, what God is saying is you belong to me now. You know, you're my, you are my property. You are my possession. You know, that is exactly what God said to the people of Israel when God chose them. You know, speaking to the people of Israel, God told them according to Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse six through eight, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his aff affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So when it came to the people of Israel, God made them his treasured possession. Israel became God's treasured possession from the moment he had redeemed them from slavery to Egypt. And in the same way, brothers and sisters, when, when a person puts their faith in Christ Jesus to redeem them from slavery to sin, as we talked about last Wednesday, God marks that person with the seal of his Holy Spirit, making that person one of his treasured possessions. You know, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit means that you are now a possession of God. And, and all throughout the Old Testament times, marking something with a seal communicated the idea of possession. You know, for example, in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah was told by God to buy a field. Just an interesting story in the Bible here. This is Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 6 through 12. It reads, Jeremiah said, the Lord spoke to spoke his word to me. He said, Jeremiah, your cousin Hanamel, son of Shalom, is going to come to you and say, buy my field that is in Anathoth. Because as the closest relative, it is your responsibility to buy it. Then, as the Lord said, uh, had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the prison. He said to me, please buy my field that is in Ananoth, in the territory of Benjamin. It is your responsibility to purchase it because the rights of the closest relative belong to you. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that the Lord had spoken to me. So I brought the field in Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and gave him the money. The field cost seven ounces of silver. Then it goes on to say in verse 10, I signed the deed, sealed it, had people witness the signing of the deed and paid out the silver. Then I took the sealed copy of the deed containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy. I gave the copies of the deeds to Barach, son of Neriah, the son of Mishaiah. I did this in the presence of my cousin Hanamel and the witness who had signed the deed and in the presence of all the Jews who were sitting in the courtyard of the prison. You can kind of perceive this as a random story in the Bible, but it's there. <laughs> but, but according to this passage of scripture, passage from the Bible, Jeremiah bought this, uh, bought his cousin's field, paid for it straight up with silver in the presence of witnesses. And it says he signed and sealed the copy of the deed according to the law as was custom at the time. The copy of the deed was signed and sealed by Jeremiah, meaning Jeremiah, he marked the copy of the deed with his seal. You know, Jeremiah, he didn't lick, you know, and seal the envelope like we do. Like, it wasn't like that. Like, we lick an envelope, we seal it in that sense. No, like he marked the copy of the deed with his seal. You know, Jeremiah was now the lawful, was now in lawful possession of that field that belonged to his cousin. You know, that field belo now belonged to Jeremiah, right? And in the same way, guys, God is in possession of those who he's marked with the seal of his Holy Spirit. You know, and only people who've been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit belong to God. I'll say that again. Only people who've been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit belong to God. You know, there's this passage here in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, which reads, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. He's talking to Christians here, and he says, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, they do not belong to God. You know, so he's saying, you know, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit now. Well, why is that the case? Well, it's because you have the Spirit of God in you. 
And if anyone does not have the spirit of God, they do not belong to God. And so only people who've been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit belong to God. That's not me saying it. It's not me casting judgment on people. This is what the Bible says. You know, also to give you another example of how being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit means that you are a possession of God. You know, back in ancient times, buying and selling timber was a big business, just like it is today, you know. <laughs> However, different from today, how it was in ancient times is the method of purchasing timber. You know, in ancient times, the merchant, after selecting his timber, often marked the timber of his own with his own seal um, so as to acknowledge which pieces of timber were under his possession. You know, so in a sense, he'd kind of mark it with his own seal, or you can think about it as branding. You know, he'd kind of put his, his seal, his, he'd brand a piece of timber, which would mean that it belonged to him or he had purchased it. And so, um, you know, so after, you know, so after, after some time would go by, the merchant would send his trusted agent uh, to, with their seal, you know, so he'd send his agent with their seal to go get the timber and that agent would locate and separate all the timbers that bore the mark of the seal of the merchant, right? You know, the agent would then claim all the timber that belonged to that merchant and he would know which timber belonged to him because it had his mark on it, it had his seal, you know, and so in the same way, God has marked with the seal of his Holy Spirit every person who has put their faith in Christ Jesus for salvation. And Christ Jesus being the agent of God that he is, think about Jesus in a sense being like an agent, you know, he's the one who will come and locate, separate, and set apart for God all who've been marked for salvation. You know, when Jesus returns from heaven, he will come to locate, separate, and set, uh, set apart all people who belong to God. It won't be confusing for Jesus. Like, he won't be like, well, I'm not sure which one, well, who's, who's, who belongs to God? Like, he's going to know because those who have the spirit of God in them belong to God. And so only people who've been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit are the only people who belong to God. You know, in ancient times, marking something with your seal means it's yours. You know, the Holy Spirit of God's seal, the Holy Spirit is God's seal in which he marks people so as to say that this person is mine. This person is mine. You know, this person belongs to me. This soul belongs to me. This person is my special possession. And so, again, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit means that you are now a possession of God's. And so my wife, she's going to share a little bit now. Yeah. So I love this, um, like just how the scripture talks about how we are um, sealed, that we're marked as belonging to him. Um, and one of the things that TJ had mentioned earlier um, is that today we don't so much use the seals as um, they did back then. But one of the things that um, we do use are our logos. And depending on different logos, we associate certain things belonging to something. Like we can glance at the different images here and we know what is associated with like Adidas, Starbucks is associated with coffee, Apple, electronics, computer devices, Mercedes, fancy cars, you know, McDonald's, Target, AT&T, like these have different characteristics that come to mind as, as we see that these things belong to that. It would be strange to, you know, have a Mercedes emblem on some tennis shoes you'd be like that doesn't really Mercedes doesn't make tennis shoes we we it would be a dead give, giveaway that it didn't belong um and there's also some some logos that are associated with Christianity you know there's the crucifix that people wear some people drive around with the little fish on their bumper stick on their bumper um, but one of the things that it talks about in the passage that we looked at earlier is that that's not those aren't the seals that God is going to be looking for um, in John 4. 23 to 24, it says, but it, but a new time is come. In fact, it is already here. 
True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers the Father is looking for. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. You know, spirit and truth are not as visible as, you know, these physical seals or logos, but there is evidence of their presence. Um, in John 3, 5 through 8, it says, um, Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. You may not be able to see the wind, but it's, you, you can see its effects. You can see it moving, you know, the trees. You can see it creating huge waves. You can see even through hurricanes and how powerful it is, but you can't visually see it, but you see the effects that it has. And in the same way, that's the way that the spirit is. And, you know, one of the things that as, as I was thinking about my life, um, as a kid, I grew up going to church. I, di I didn't grow up going to church on a regular basis, but I, when I was a, a infant, I was baptized as a child and we would go to church occasionally. So I did believe in God. Um, but, you know, like I said, it wasn't a regular thing that we would attend church. Um, and when, um, as I got older, my dad took me um, to CCD so I could make my first communion. And I remember when I was attending those classes, like I wanted to, to learn and I, I wanted to do what was right. But to be honest, like what I learned, um, it, it had no effect on my life. Um, and as I grew um, older, even though I was brought up to believe in God and I could label myself as a Christian and wear the label, um, and go, you know, still keep doing what I was doing and go to church every now and then. I knew that I, I wasn't really living as a Christian um, by, by the way that my life was. And I didn't want to be a hypocrite. And I think one of the things that I, I saw even within um, Christianity that kind of turned me off was that I saw a lot of hypocrisy. I didn't really see people that I saw the effect of the truth and, and God's word in, in their lives. Um, and it really made me question it all. It made me question. And you know, I started getting to a point where I didn't even know if I believed in God anymore. So I wrestled with that. Um, but I did figure, you know, if there is a God. He knows what I'm doing when I'm not at church and I'm not fooling him. So I might as well sleep in <laughs> on Sunday. So, but that, that was one of the things that I didn't just want to pretend. Um, so from my teens all the way till right before I, I, turned 25, I, I lived in an uncertainty of whether or not I believed in God. You know, I, at times I would, and at times I, I just had so many questions and doubts. Um, and it wasn't until like short, just right before my 25th birthday, I had gone to the Dominican to meet my um, boyfriend's family at the time. And to be honest, I was not really seeking God at that time at all. 
Um, but I met someone there who was, and I had never met anybody like her. Um, she, she lived very humbly. Um, she didn't have any of the things that I was pursuing in life or striving for, but she had something that I wanted. And now that I know what the Bible says and like, she was marked, um, not by a cross or, you know, any emblem, but she was marked by God's spirit. There's a scripture in first John four, 12. It says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I always get emotional because the way that she made me feel, um, her love for God flowed out to me. I had never felt God's presence like that. I had never felt his love like that. And I just remember that night in my hotel room, as I thought about her, I, I, I prayed for the first time in a really long time. You know, God, if you're really there, I want to know you like her. And I had no idea what I was praying for. Um, but, you know, God got right on it. So this was in the Dominican. And after that, I came back home to Ohio and probably a couple weeks after that, one of my clients invited me to come to a women's day. And then from that, I started studying the Bible. And just like the scripture that TJ read, um, Ephesians 1 13, it says, as you also, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You know, after studying the Bible, after hearing the message of salvation, I believed. And he marked me with the most remarkable seal. You know, not a imprint of on wax, not, you know, an imprint on wood and all of these other things that he had marked, but he put his very own spirit inside of me, you know, and, and now I am his, you know, his, his spirit is in me and, and he has sealed me to be his own, just like he was in her and his presence was known. Now he has sealed me with that very same spirit. And I, I think as I walk with him and in sweet fellowship, like that, those are the, 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 the markings, you know, just like you can't see the wind, but you can see when people are walking with God. And, and that's the hope that I have for me is that you can see that God is with me. Um, just like I saw that in her. There you go. Thank you. So, you know, so that the point there, you know, tying it in with what Leela had shared is that being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit means that you are now a possession of God, like God, you, we belong to God. And so secondly, you know, when it comes to being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, being marked with the seal of God's Spirit, Holy Spirit means that your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure. And so in ancient times, you know, often kings and others in authority would mark with their seals something or someone uh, that should not be touched or tampered with. You know, and an author, a preacher and author by the name of John MacArthur wrote, in ancient times, the mark of a seal from a king, prince, or nobleman represented security and untouchability. You know, I'll say that again. In, in ancient times, the mark of a seal from a king, prince, or nobleman represented security and untouchability. You know, for example, and these are the little things that you don't, you know, you don't sometimes pick up right away when you're reading the scriptures, but it's there. 
But for example, when David was thrown into the lion's den, King Darius, along with his nobles, marked their seals on the stone placed over the entrance to the den. You know, this is according to Daniel chapter 6, verse 17. It says, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. You know, I never, I never noticed that before, but it's right there. But in other words, any person who tried to rescue Daniel would have forfeited their life because they'd be put to death. You know, King Darius authorized for the stone placed over the mouth of the lion's den to be re to, to remain secure, to, to, to remain untouched. You know, in a similar way, the tomb where Jesus was buried was marked with Pilate's seal. You know, fearing that, that Jesus' disciples might steal his body and falsely claim his resurrection, the Jewish leaders convinced Pilate to mark his seal on the stone that closed Jesus' tomb and to have uh, it guarded with soldiers. And so this is Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 through 66. It says, the next day um, was the day after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, sir. They said, we remember something that liar said while he was still alive. And they're talking about Jesus. He claimed after three days, I will rise again. So give the order to make the tomb secure until the third day. If you don't, his disciples might come and steal the body. Then they will tell the people that Jesus has been raised from the dead. This last lie will be worse than the first. Take some guards with you, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure. They put a royal seal on the tomb and placed some guards on duty. Crazy, right there in the Bible. And so in other words, Pilate marked his seal on the tomb of Jesus, authorizing that it was not to be touched or tampered with. You know, Jesus' tomb was meant to be secured. Um, and of course, we know how the story ends, right? But in the same way, I share all this to say, brothers and sisters, when a person has been sealed with God's Holy Spirit, as my wife talked about, sharing her own personal story, her testimony, that person's eternal relationship with God in heaven is meant to be secured. You know, it's meant to be secured. Again, writing to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul wrote saying, when you believed, as she shared, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Another English translation of that same passage reads, you put your faith in Christ and were given the promised Holy Spirit to show that you belong to God. The Spirit also makes sure, I love that, it makes sure that you will be given what God has stored up for his people. And so God's Holy Spirit is what guarantees and secures a Christian's future of having eternal life in heaven. You know, it's the spirit of God. It's not, it's not our works. It's not what we do and how much we read our Bibles. Do we need to do those things? Absolutely. But it's the spirit of God that secures, you know, our eternal life in heaven. You know, God's Holy Spirit secures, in other words, make sure. It's the spirit that's trying to make sure that we you know, who have put our faith in Christ Jesus will be given what God has stored up for us in heaven. You know, uh, here's another passage writing to the Christians in the church, uh, to uh, Christians in the city of Corinth. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 through 22, which reads, it is God himself who makes us together with you sure of our life in union with Christ. It is God himself who has set us apart who has placed his mark of ownership upon us, who has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the guarantee of all that he has in store for us. Same message. He's just writing it to a different church, trying to help them understand the power of the Holy Spirit and how it was placed in our hearts. And through it, God has marked his ownership of us. And so as Christians, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit is meant to be a comfort. Like we should be, and that's what they call the Holy Spirit, actually, the paraclete, the, the great comforter. Like Jesus said that, like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the great comforter with you, you know, um, but it's meant to be a comfort and a guarantee, you know, that nothing from the outside can come between us and all that God has stored up for us in heaven. You know, it is meant to be a comfort and a guarantee that nothing from the outside can come between us and our resurrection. You know, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit is meant to be a comfort and a guarantee that nothing can, can make God loosen his grip 
on us because we belong to God. And the spirit is there protecting us and securing us to make sure that God can never lose his grip on us. Nothing on heaven, nothing on earth or in heaven can, can change that. And so, as you can see, and hopefully this is made clear, but us being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit is kind of a big deal, right? It's, it's a pretty, pretty big deal. You know, it's absolutely a big deal. And so now here's the million dollar question, okay? The million dollar question. And I know that most of you know the answer to this question, but perhaps you need a refresher course, okay? Maybe you need a refresher course, but the million dollar question is, at what point does being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit happen in a person's life? You know, does it happen if you ask for it to happen in a prayer to God? You know, does it happen if you ask someone to pray it, pray for it to happen in your life? You know, does it simply happen if you attend church services every Sunday? You know, and if so, how many church services must you attend before you, you get God's Holy Spirit? Is that the case? You know, at what point does being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, um, thus becoming saved, happen in a person's life? You know, being marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit happens when a person believes and responds to the truth about how to become saved. You know, so, so what's the truth about how to become saved? Well, take a look at this next slide. You know, um, you know we, we know this passage, but speaking to people who weren't saved, the Apostle Peter preached the first ever sermon about Jesus shortly before Jesus, um, shortly at, or following Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And within Peter's sermons, he straightforwardly preached about how a person can be marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, thus becoming saved. You know, Peter didn't sugarcoat his first sermon. He didn't dance around what needed to be said. Peter simply explained how to become saved in a way that wasn't um, complicated. It was uncomplicated and easy to do and understand. And so here's what Peter had to say. You know, it's Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41. All, all the people of Israel should know beyond a doubt that God made Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were deeply upset. Uh, they asked Peter and other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter answered, you all must turn to God. You know, our NIVs will say, you know, repent, you know, repent and be baptized. But essentially what that means is you all must turn to God and change the way you think and act. Repentance, metanoia. And each, each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven. You know, then you will receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. God is giving his Holy Spirit as a gift based on our repentance and uh, our faith and our repentance and baptism. This promise belongs to you and to your children and to everyone who is far away. It belongs to everyone who worships the Lord our God. Peter said much more to warn them. He urged them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted what Peter said were baptized that day. About 3,000 people were added to the group. And so what was Peter's direction to these people about how to become saved? You know, here's, I just kind of put it in this graphic form, you know, not that it's a, a formula or a, like an equation of this sense, but essentially it's faith in Jesus plus repentance from sins plus baptism equals forgiveness of sins and the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And, and what we must all understand is that what Peter preached as far as the way to become saved was exactly what Jesus preached as far as the way to become saved. You know, we we know the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. And so, and you know, this is John 3, verse 1 through 7. You know, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Um, after one dark evening, he came in, to speak to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident Evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back to his mother's womb to be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. And so again, according to Jesus himself, you know, to be born again means to be born of water and the spirit. And otherwise, a person cannot see the kingdom of God, meaning eternal life with God is not an option for that person. You know, so when it comes to all who are on this Zoom call, you know, are you a person who's been born of water and the spirit? And, and how encouraging it is that Laura, our sister who, you know, she shared earlier, like she's going to be born again. And guess what? She's going to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit and she's going to be marked. And it's so exciting, you know, 
not only to us, but it's it's exciting to God. He he has someone else now who's his treasured possession. And that's what you're going to be to him, Laura. And so, but again, for everyone on this call, are you someone who has been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, which will secure your salvation, you know, which will guarantee your future of having eternal life in heaven, you know, which will make you a treasured possession of God. You know, remember that only people who've been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit are treasured possessions of God and are people who belong to God. And so, and if that's the case for you, if that's not the case for you rather, but you want that to be the case, please reach out to me or Leela to help you with that. Because I know there's a lot of people on this call, a lot of people don't have their screens on. And so I don't know who's listening. I'm not gonna assume that everybody on this call is someone who's been marked. So this is me reaching out and just saying, hey, you know, allow yourself to be marked with God's Holy Spirit. And so just wanted to preach that for a second, but, but in conclusion, for those of you who have been born again, I wanna close with these words from the Apostle Paul, just to encourage you guys. So as we wrap up here, just reflecting back on his life and the lives of others before becoming born again, the Apostle Paul had this to say according to Titus 3, verse 3 through 7. He says, at one time, we too acted like fools. Here you go. But we didn't obey God. We were tricked. We were controlled by all kinds of desires and pleasure. We were full of evil. We wanted, to, we wanted what belongs to others. People hated us and we hated one another. But the kindness and love of, of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. It wasn't because of the good things we had done. It was because of his mercy. You got to remember that. He saved us. How? By washing away our sins. We were born again. The Holy Spirit gave us new life. God poured out his spirit on us freely. That's because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, has done. His grace made us right with God. So now we receive the hope of eternal life as children of God. And likewise, he says this, you know, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20 through 22. It, said, it reads, God who has made great many promises, right? God, is, God has made great many of promises, a great many of promises. They are all yes because of what Christ has done. So through Christ, we say amen, right? We say amen. We want God to receive glory. He makes both us and you remain strong in the faith because we belong to Christ. He anointed us. He put his spirit in our hearts and marked us as his own we can now be sure that he will give us everything he has promised. Mm -hmm. And so brothers and sisters, over and over again, the apostle Paul makes it clear that being in Christ, us being in Christ is the most awesome of realities. You know, may none of us take for granted what Christ has done for us, you know, what he's done. And may we as Christians embrace our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I just covered four things, but there's so much more I could talk about. We really could do a whole month of more classes on this, but we're not going to. So, but, but, um, but God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And so this concludes our midweek class. Hopefully I did hit it out the park like Ray said I should do. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, this ends our classes on who do you think you are? Amen, brothers and sisters. And to God be the glory. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop recording, turn off uh, and then uh, turn off the screen share and then you guys can kind of uh, share, give a response, just your takeaway from this class or even previous classes.